Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Lauren Heidrink. I'm chair of the Public Policy Administration Program, and welcome to National, Uni National Lewis University's 2015-2016 Practitioner Series keynote. If you have not joined us before, the Practitioner Series provides a unique opportunity for NLU students, faculty, and staff, as well as a wider community to engage with key leaders and practitioners addressing critical public policy issues locally and globally. So now it's my honor to invite the Dean of the College of Professional Studies and Advancement, uh, Dr. Judah Viola, to introduce our esteemed speaker. Thanks, Lauren. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for uh, the Public Policy Administration Practitioner Speaker Series. We have a special keynote tonight. Uh, we're honored to welcome the Cook County Board President, Tony Preckwinkle. President Preckwinkle has been a dedicated community leader for over two decades. She has worked with the Cook County Board of Commissioners, elected officials, and county employees to implement major reforms and reshape county government through fiscal responsibility, innovative leadership, transparency and accountability, and improved services. Since taking office in December 2010, President Preckwinkle has rebuilt the credibility of county government, solving for more than $1.4 in budget deficits and cutting $465 million in expenditures. President Preckwinkle has developed a broad policy agenda focusing on critical public policy, public safety reform, working to strengthen the, community, the county's health care system, and increasing the capacity of economic development efforts. Before being elected to the Cook County Board President position, President Preckwinkle served 19 years as Alderman of the Fourth Ward. During her tenure, she worked to improve local public schools and increase the amount of affordable housing. Prior to holding elected office, President Preckwinkle taught high school, in, for, high school history for 10 years. Tonight, President Preckwinkle will discuss her accomplished career in government, as well as the challenges and rewards of public service. Please join me in a warm welcome for President Tony Preckwinkle. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I want to thank you for inviting me. I'm a teacher by profession, so it's always great to be back at educational institutions. For those of you who don't know, I'm not from Chicago. I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. Actually, I came to Chicago to go to college uh, and earned my bachelor's and, and master's degree here. Uh, and then I taught high school history for 10 years. So I'm a history teacher by profession. And I, I always say that um, being a teacher is great preparation for public life. For one thing, it teaches you to uh, think on your feet. It teaches you to try to distill difficult concepts and information and, and present them in ways that ordinary folks could understand. And I always say, too, that there's no tougher audience than a classroom of teenagers. I ran for alderman in my fourth ward home which includes Hyde Park, North Kenwood, Oakland, Douglas, Grand Boulevard, <coughs> and lost twice in 1983 and 1987. I usually say that I was too dumb to give up. On my third try in 1991, I defeated the incumbent, the same person I've been running against for almost a decade, by 109 votes out of 11,000 cast. So particularly whenever I talk to young people, I talk about the importance of their vote and taking nothing for granted. If those 109 people who were my margin of victory had stayed home, I'd be doing something else today. I always tell young people that in life they'll face many challenges, but if you believe in something and you're willing to work hard, you can be successful. And it's that belief, that conviction, that kept me running for alder alderman even after losing twice. And ultimately, it's that conviction that led me to run for county board president. My passion for public service and politics long predated my winning that first election. I've been interested and involved in politics almost all my life. So, how many of you have been working, worked in political campaigns? Raise your hands. A few, not enough. So I worked in my first campaign when I was 16 years old. I worked for Katie McWatt, who was the first African-American woman to run for city council in St. Paul, Minnesota, where I grew up. 
We knocked on doors, we got family and friends to put out yard signs, we stuffed envelopes, we made phone calls. Not exactly exciting, but it's the kind of nitty gritty work um, that you do when you're involved in a political campaign. And while Katie McWatt didn't win, uh, I decided that I like politics. And when I came to Chicago, I continued to work in political campaigns. As a teacher, I would always tell my students that democracy is at the same time the best and the most fragile form of government on earth. The best and the most fragile for the same reason. It depends on an active, engaged citizenry. Active and engaged. So voting is necessary but not sufficient. It's the beginning of your obligations as a citizen, not the end. If you really want to have a strong democracy, you have to work for people who you think will make good leaders. And hopefully some of you will consider running for office yourself. I know that as somebody who has had the, the opportunity to have the, the vast majority of my adult life in public service, um, I believe that there are two basic obli obligations of government. One is to provide good service, clearly, and the other is to do so as effectively and efficiently as possible. I've been Cook County Board President for five years now, and I can tell you it's been anything but easy. But if you have a great team, and you have sound advice and counsel, you are able to accomplish a good deal. The first thing we did was start out by trying to make our standards and, and expect expectations clear. So I laid out the four basic tenets that you heard previously. Fiscal responsibility, innovative leadership, transparency and accountability, and improved services. These four basic principles have shaped every one of our decisions, and buy-in from staff has allowed us to move the county forward. We've balanced our budgets, instituted performance-based management to de demand more accountability from our operations and our employees, focused on public safety reform, and worked to strengthen the health care system while reducing the subsidy from the county. I'm proud of what we've been able to accomplish since taking office in December of 2010. But as I mentioned earlier, governing has its challenges, and we're currently in the midst of confronting some of those challenges. We've worked hard to deal with the fiscal excesses and bad practices of the past, but the county is facing a tremendous challenge in the shortfall in pension funding. That shortfall is in excess of $6.5 billion. That's $6.5 billion and grows at the rate of a million dollars a month just like a credit card in which you pay neither the principal nor the interest. Clearly, this is unsustainable and unacceptable. I determined that we had to make the hard choice to raise the sales tax. This was not an easy decision for me, as I'd campaigned on rolling the sales tax back in 2010. And let me just say, we worked hard to try to get help from Springfield. We went to Springfield with pension legislation in 2014. We got it passed in the Senate and it was not called in the House because we, the Speaker of the House wanted to have a bipartisan uh, bill and we couldn't get any Republican support. We went back in 2015, this time we started in the House, and our Republican governor uh, refused to take the brick, that is, allow Republicans to support our pension bill, and so it stalled in the House. Um, this is a real problem for us because the bill that we drafted with our employees involve shared sacrifice, not just additional contributions on the part of employers, but also increased contributions on the part of our employees, extending the time to retirement, extending the length of time over which you computed your final benefits. There are all kinds of concessions by our employees in addition to more money on our part. But that legislation uh, ha was not able to be passed in Springfield, and so this summer, having made two runs at Springfield support in 2014 and 2015, we, we decided we were going to have to do something ourselves. I personally would have um, wished that we could raise property taxes rather than sales taxes, because I think that's fair. But there were no votes for an increase in property taxes in the Board of Commissioners. We have 17 commissioners, not one, zero would support a property tax increase. So we went to the sales tax. Even though that was inconvenient for me, uh, given my previous commitment to roll the sales tax back when I came in office. But leaders are elected to lead, and that means confronting unpopular issues head on and not engaging in smoke and mirrors politics or shifting burdens to our children and grandchildren. We worked hard 
to find the votes to increase the sales tax, and the board ultimately did so in July, for which I'm grateful. The funds will pay down our pension shortfall, address legacy debt service, by which I mean our, our indebtedness. Uh, we have 5.3 million people. Los Angeles County has 11 million. We have twice as much debt as Los Angeles County. And that's a result of injudicious decisions made by my predecessors over decades. So we're addressing our pension shortfall, our legacy debt service, and infrastructure improvements. In addition, we are in the final run-up to the adoption of our fiscal year 2016 budget. We started with the need to close a gap of almost $200 million, and we've done so through expense reductions, reducing employee headcount, and finding efficiencies wherever possible. None of this is easy, and I will be blunt. Public office is not for the thin-skinned or faint-hearted. It's easy to be Santa Claus, to promise and to give, to cut, that's difficult. Yet when coping with challenges, there is self-fulfillment. As a public servant, you can help those truly in need. You can work towards a more just and fair criminal justice system. You can support a climate that allows the business community to grow and prosper. You can confront and resolve structural problems that have long-term implications for real people. You can work with allies or across the political aisle to make government more effective, efficient, and responsive. In fact, public service, collaboration, and cooperation are critical to solving almost everything. And breaking it down to personal level, it's never too early to build your own network of colleagues, friends, associates, mentors. All of them will help push you, help shape your thinking, or just be in your corner. I have, people, I have people that I've known for decades who still offer much needed advice, counsel, and opinions. I may not agree with them all the time, but I'm always grateful for their advice. All right, uh, I promised that I would keep my remarks short tonight, so I think I'm going to quit there and take your questions, which is always the most interesting part of these, of these encounters for me. So thank you all. Uh, well, yeah, my name's uh, Dallas Mallory, and I work for uh, the U.S. Department of Education. I actually graduated from here in 2010 with a master's in public policy. Good. So my question is, uh, living here for the past 11 years, I've seen a lot with the administration. So I would like to know what is really the vast difference between you as a Cook County Board President and the mayor so do you guys work independent of each other, dependent? Because I know you guys agree, but yet disagree. So I'm still trying to figure out what's really the difference between the two offices. OK. So Cook County has 5.3 million people. Half of those people live in the city of Chicago. And the remaining half live in the cities, towns, and villages on the perimeter of the city. <clears throat> Historically, um, the city and the county didn't work together. Shortly after the mayor was elected in 2011, but before he took office, we sat down and talked. I never really met him before. Well, I met him once. I never really talked to him much. So <clears throat> we talked about the fact that we shared a building, but we didn't, the city and the county didn't cooperate or collaborate. So once he was sworn in, we set up a task force of nine people to look at the areas where it was possible for us to coordinate activities or collaborate. And that task force came up with 24 ideas and we've been working our way through those ever since. We've, the last time I checked, we saved county taxpayers about $70 million um, because we do <coughs> um, shared services. Uh, printing, for example, we have some equipment the city has and they have equipment we don't have, so we kind of swap that out. Um, we piggyback on each other's bids for goods and services. We combined our workforce training initiatives there was one workforce training entity for Chicago and one for suburban Cook in the west and south suburbs, and then a separate independent one on the north and northwest side. So we had three employment training entities in the county. Um, and if you lived in Chicago, they wouldn't tell you about jobs in the suburbs. And likewise, if you live in the suburbs, they wouldn't tell you about jobs in the city. And we know that people live and work all across the county. So one of our um, principal initiatives was to create the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership which is a not-for-profit organization that gets government money, and because it's a not-for-profit, can also get 
business and philanthropic support, and that entity now deals with employment training issues for the whole county. Um, but as I said, shared services, things like the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership, piggybacking on each other's con contracts, um, are all ways in which we've uh, cooperated and collaborated, and as I said, saved taxpayers tens of millions of dollars. Um, the mayor and I don't always agree. We try to work together. Afternoon. Um, my name is Anwar Vega. I'm a graduate student here at Public Policy, but I'm also Vice President of Community Engagement for the Alzheimer's Association. Okay. Um, so the question that I have is, as you know, there's 210,000 people in Illinois living with Alzheimer's. Um, with no budget and with the budget cuts to the Community Cares Program, what strategies do you have or are you currently working with the state to restore the Community Cares Program? So I wish I could say I was working with the state. <laughs> Um, as I told you in my remarks, we went to Springfield twice to try to get our pension bill passed, um, and basically because of the opposition first of the uh, Republican nominee and then the Republican governor, we were not able to do that. Um, talking to my state representatives and the state senator, it's quite clear that nothing's going to happen in Springfield until the budget situation is resolved, nothing. Uh, and that's a real problem. As you point out, it's a problem for people who are struggling with Alzheimer's. It's a problem for, for families that need daycare that in the past was subsidized by the state. Um, it's, a, it's a problem for families that have children with developmental disabilities and, and need state support and assistance. It's also a problem for local units of government. <clears throat> One of the things that the state is not doing is passing on the motor fuel tax money that it collects on behalf of cities, towns, and villages. Uh, for Cook County, we have enough of a reserve that we can buy salt and plow streets this winter. But not all cities, towns, and villages will have that. And unless the budget crisis is resolved, they're not going to have the money to provide basic services like snow plowing in their, in their cities. So this, this has an impact um, on, a, on a broad spectrum of um, government operations and a broad spectrum of, of community organizations and, and not-for-profits. So it's, it's not a uh, victimless situation by any means. And I, you know, it's, I don't know, I'm ashamed. <laughs> I'm ashamed that we live in a state where, where people can't figure out how to work together and where we have a governor, frankly, who's made his ideological uh, priorities uh, supersede his, his duty to govern. I mean, He's insisting that, that the Democrats eviscerate public employee unions and do all kinds of other stuff that has nothing to do with the budget process before he will even talk to them. I, it's kind of incomprehensible. It's the first time in our history this ever happened. We've had Republican governors. They figured out how to work with Democratic legislators. It's, you know, it's, or Democratic governors who figured out how to work with Republican legislators. But we've never had this kind of situation before. Uh, good evening, Madam President. Thank you for being here. My name is Christopher Walton. I'm a graduate student here with the Public Policy and Administration Program. My question to you is, what are your opinions on intergovernmental agreements and intergovernmental cooperations as it relates to eliminating extra layers of redundant government? Or, or what are your thoughts of government consolidations as a means to execute that? All right. As many of you may know, uh, Illinois has more units of government than any other state in the, in the country. And actually, we have twice as many as Pennsylvania, which I think is the next highest number. And what happens is that, frankly, the more um, units of government you have, the more redundancy and inefficiency there is, and the higher the tax burden for people. Now, the good people of Illinois, over time, uh, have, have made these choices. We have, for example, a lot of very small school districts that have one or two schools in them. And we separate school districts from you know, elementary and high school. Um, we have township government. We have, as I said, we have twice as many units of government as any other state in the country. Um, what we've focused on, the, I will just say that for me, um, given the, the mess that I inherited from my predecessor, I've focused on, on trying to make Cook County government uh, work more efficiently rather than looking outside government for things I could spend my political capital on. Um, I think that consolidation um, is a real good idea, and the political capital it takes to do it is enormous. 
So the emphasis we've put um, in the county is trying to encourage people to think about shared services, shared police services, shared fire services. Um, we've allowed people to uh, piggyback on our, our bids so that they have the advantage of economies of scale. And so the, the sort of shared services and uh, collaboration and cooperation is the direction that we've taken. Although I don't question the need for fewer units of government in Illinois. Got somebody in the back there with a hand up? Uh, hello, I'm Clinton Stockwell. I'm an instructor here. Um, we're using the book in one of the classes that I work with called The New Jim Crow, which, you, as you know, is about the, uh, the criminal justice system. And I also know that you've been working very hard on this for a long time. And uh, could you just remind us of kind of what our challenges are uh, with criminal justice in the, in the uh, Chicago area and where we are currently in that struggle? Okay, thank you. So Cook County has 5.3 million people. About 25% of them are Latino, about 25% African American, about 6% Asian. So this is a county in which people of color are the majority. Remember, 25% Latino, 25% African American. However, in our jail in Cook County, 86% of the people are black and brown. 86% are black and brown. And although Chicago's half the population, 80% of the people in the jail are from Chicago. So it's policing strategies in Chicago, especially in black and brown neighborhoods, that drive our jail population. <clears throat> My daughter, who's college age, had a friend at Northwestern, and she went up there one day to visit, and she said, she came back and she said, Mom, you won't believe it. The kids, they walk down the street smoking dope, and nobody says anything. The way in which the laws get enforced um, is often a function of the race and class of the community. And things that black and brown kids get arrested for are not things that white kids get arrested for. Uh, at every point in the criminal justice system, uh, you can see the effects of race and class. Who gets picked up rather than shooed home? Who, if they get picked up, is taken to their parents' house as opposed to the police station? Who, when they get to the police station, has their parents called, and who gets put into the criminal justice system? And of course, what happens once you get in the criminal justice system? So what I usually say is that, you know, our jail in Cook County is at the intersection of racism and poverty. Black and brown people are disproportionately represented. Poor people are disproportionately represented. We have a cash bond system in most places in this country, which means that you come before a judge and a bond is set. You have to post 10% of whatever the bond amount is. And you could be accused of a very serious crime, and if you have the cash, you're out in the street and in the community. But we've had people who sit in our jail accused of stealing six bars of soap from CVS, and they've spent weeks in jail because they don't have the money to pay their bond. So this challenge in equities in our criminal justice system is one we wanted to address as soon as we came into office. Um, so I was elected in December. In March, after our first budget cycle, March of 2011, we brought the actors together in the public safety arena, the sheriff, the chief judge, the public defender, the clerk of the court, the state's attorney, and we said, you know, what, what are the challenges that you face in the public safety arena? <coughs> what what uh, milestones, what metrics do you want to set to measure your progress in, in dealing with those challenges? So they all agreed, all five actors, that we had too many people accused of nonviolent crimes sitting in our jail awaiting the disposition of their cases. The jail population at that point hovered around 10,000. And you know, contrary to what you might think, most of the people in our jail are not serving a sentence. Only 10% of the people in our jail on any given day are serving a sentence. 90% are awaiting trial. And of those who are awaiting trial, 70% are awaiting trial for nonviolent offenses. They're there because of possession of Ill illegal substances, shoplifting or prostitution, the things people do to get money for their drugs, not paying their child support, not paying their traffic tickets. 70% of the people who are awaiting trial are awaiting trial for nonviolent offenses. Only 30% are awaiting trial for violent offenses, murder and rape and robbery, the things that scare us. 
And even those are accused and not convicted. So <clears throat> having had all the actors in the criminal justice arena agree in March of 2011 that we ought to reduce the jail population by trying to see that those who are accused of nonviolent crimes await the disposition of their case in their community so they can continue to go to work and support their families, they can continue to go to school. Having gotten that commitment from everyone, two and a half years later in the summer of 2013, jail population was still 10,000. So it's very frustrating to me. And I wrote a letter to the Supreme Court and I said, you're responsible for the courts in Illinois, I need your help. Everybody in this arena has said that we can safely have fewer people in the jail and it's not happening. The Supreme Court was not very happy with me for calling this to their attention and asking them to, to uh, intervene. But a couple months later, we had the first meeting of all those five actors and myself to talk about what we could do. Uh, we decided to focus on bond court and bond court reform. There are now 8,100 people in the jail. So there's a 19% reduction. Uh, and it's principally because of how people get treated in bond court. When we started, 20% of the people who came into the bond court got electronic monitoring, EM, that's the ankle bracelets, or were released on their own recognizance, what we call I-bonds. That's just your promise that you're going to show up for your hearings and for your trial. So 20%, when we started this process, it's now 67% that are out on their own recognizance or on electronic monitoring. And that's the reason, basically, that the jail population has gone down so far. And we still see roughly the same number of, same percentage of people, about 2% who, who screw up, who don't show up for their trial or for their hearings, and about 2% who are accused of a new offense before their, their previous offense is disposed of. So we haven't seen a dramatic change in bad behavior by people who are out in the community as opposed to sitting in jail. It's still about 2%. 2% failed to show up for their hearings or their trial, 2% are accused of a new crime. And that's what it was when the jail was 10,000 people. So um, we've worked hard on the bond court part of the criminal justice system, which is it's kind of the port of entry. Uh, but we also need to work on the time that it takes to dispose of cases. And for even very simple cases in our justice system, it's often weeks or months uh, before a case is disposed of. And that means that a person who may subsequently be uh, found innocent or have the charges dropped against them spends weeks or months in jail. So we've got some real challenges in criminal justice which we're trying to address and those uh, challenges are inextricably uh, bound by race and class and um, as I said it's a challenge we're, we're struggling to address. Way in the back and then I think there's a lady up here too. Hi, I'm a faculty member here at NLU. I'm just curious what your thoughts are about if, if Illinois had a unified school districts or the county had a unified school districts, would that enhance student learning and um, the state in general in terms of education? Well, here's the problem. We have, we have some very small school districts. Sometimes they don't only have one or two schools, one or two elementary schools. Um, and then we have districts that are separated elementary schools and high schools, so um, I, I forget the, the educational term, but anyway, the, the coordination of the curriculum isn't always what it should be, to be sure that the kids leaving that elementary district are prepared for the high school in the, in the other district. Um, so I guess my argument would be that one of the things that the state needs to do is um, work with our school districts around consolidation. I, I, it's crazy to have one school and to have a principal and then have a superintendent and a staff. I mean, but that's where we, that's where we are in some of the southern, southern parts of this county, or only have two schools. I mean, and then you have all this bureaucracy on top of that. That's why it's, that's why it's so expensive. And if you figure we have almost 400,000 kids in the Chicago public schools, both high school and elementary school, and one, one board of education, one, uh, one, one bureaucratic you know, entity responsible, you would think that we could have larger school districts el in number elsewhere in the, in, the, in the state, and particularly in this county. I think there was a question over here. 
Hi, my name is William Lopez. I'm a graduate student here, public policy. Um, you mentioned uh, the sales tax increase by 1%, um, which puts Chicago at the highest in the nation. Yes. Um, critics say that that will lead inhabitants crossing border lines to purchase elsewhere. Um, and I also recently read that you also brought forward a proposal to expand the categories for entertainment tax. Um, and Cook County having 17.8% poverty rate, and which is 3.3 higher than the national average, and um, a 6.5% unemployment rate, which is 1% higher than the national average. Um, I just come to question what other proposals were there uh, considered other than increasing taxes? <laughs> Sometimes the only answer is to have more money. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sometimes the only answer is to have more money. That pension, let's talk about pensions. Six and a half billion dollars in unfunded liability. Six and a half billion. And you're accumulating debt at the rate of a million dollars a day. What are you gonna do? We went to Springfield. We were unsuccessful in getting help in Springfield. And so we said, we have to do what we can ourselves. And let me just say, the deal we worked out with our employees um, involved shared sacrifice. Our employees agreed to contribute more to the pension fund. They agreed to retire later, five years later. They agreed to have their pensions computed over a longer period of time and not just their highest earning three years. And in return, we as employer agreed to put more money into pensions and to create a health care trust fund for our retirees. But that legislation was stalled in Springfield. And we knew that we were continuing to accrue this indebtedness. You know, like it or not, this is the money that we owe to the pension, to the pension fund. So we decided that we would do what we could to raise more money ourselves to contribute to the pension fund so we didn't continue to accrue these liabilities and have them, you know, multiply. Uh, I personally would have, pre would have preferred a property tax increase. I think that's fairer than sales tax. It's less regressive. Both of them are regressive. The most progressive, of course, is a progressive income tax. Uh, but that was not within our power. So it was either property taxes or sales taxes. I talked to every one of our kids. There's not one of them out of the 17. Zero would have supported property tax. So it didn't matter what I wanted. I could get nine votes to raise the sales tax so we'd have the money uh, to deal with our pension obligations, or I could do nothing. So I raised the sales tax, and I got commissioners to uh, agree to support it. This year, so that's our, that's our ongoing structural problems, our pension indebtedness, our legacy debt service. So we have 5.3 million people half the population of Los Angeles County, and twice as much debt. Now that's a function of injudicious decisions by my predecessors that go back decades. <clears throat> but it's still debt that I gotta deal with. I, we can't just say we're not gonna pay our debts. Um, so we, some of that sales tax money is gonna go to what we call legacy debt service, principal interest on past debt. The third thing that the money's gonna go for is, is infrastructure, roads and bridges. Uh, every unit of government, the state, the city, the county, has diverted motor fuel tax money historically. One of the, one of the um, allowed diversions is into criminal justice, and so we've been diverting money into our criminal justice system. But that means we're not spending the money that we need to spend on roads and bridges. So we're going to stop doing that, and the sales tax revenue will help us. So three things that the money's going for. Overwhelmingly, out of the first year, $308 million, $270 million of it is going to pensions and then legacy debt service and, and infrastructure. So that's the first part of your question. The second part of your question, and those are long-term structural issues that we're trying to deal with. The second question was the choice to raise revenue for this operating year. In addition to our long-term structural challenges, uh, we have challenges annually in putting the budget together. And that's basically because the revenue sources that we have, uh, sales tax, property tax, cigarette taxes, uh, are either flat or declining. Cook County has not raised the property tax since uh, 1994. So your property tax bill may have gone up, but not because the county took a bigger bite. The county's sales tax, property tax um, allocation has been the same since 1994. So more than 20 years. Um, sales taxes, although we're increasing the percentage, um, have not been rising as fast as our expenditures. So property taxes have been pretty much sta static. 
sales taxes have been not rising as fast as our expenditures, nor have other uh, revenue sources that we have. So every year we face the challenge of figuring out how we're going to balance our budget. This year we made $108 million in cuts before anything else. And over the five years that I've been in office, we've made um, 450 plus 108 this year. Uh, so 450 plus 100 is 550 something, 560 roughly, uh, million dollars in cuts that we've made. We, in this budget cycle, we're unfortunately having to lay off people, and we're also closing a number of vacant positions. So it's a, it's a tough budget year. We looked at uh, possible sources of revenue, and one of those was an entertainment tax um, on areas we hadn't covered before. If you go to the movies or if you go to uh, play or if you go to a concert, you pay an entertainment tax for the city and the county. And we thought we should extend that to uh, in-home entertainment. So that's um, cable, basically. And um, participatory sports, like going golfing or whatever. Because if you, if you go out for entertainment, you pay the tax. But if you're in-home, you don't pay an entertainment tax. Um, actually, you pay a city of Chicago entertainment tax, but you didn't pay a county entertainment tax. So, um, again, you know, this is the executive can propose, but we have to get legislative approval. And just like I wanted a, a property tax, and nobody wanted to do that, so we have a sales tax, I thought that it was reasonable to extend the tax on entertainment to cable. Uh, but I've had meetings with my commissioners over the last couple of days, and they don't agree. So we're going to look for different sources of revenue. Um, as I said, you know, government is an interactive process. You do the best you can to figure out what you think you can get through the body. If you can't do it, you try something else. So we're looking at alternatives to the entertainment tax. That's the short answer. But you know, it's what I what I've said before is that those of us who are, have the misfortune to be in executive positions today are struggling with issues that result from the inattention, inaction, or irresponsibility of our predecessors. Why is it that Cook County has twice as much debt as Los Angeles County and half as many people? Because my predecessors over decades weren't very judicious about how they spent public money, that's why. Um, and likewise, if you look at the city of Chicago and its, its pension issues, they needed to be addressed over time for a long time before this year. Uh, and unfortunately, the city council and the mayor are struggling now to raise the money they need to, to make the pension systems whole. Um, and in, although it's not true of Cook County, we've always paid what our pension obligation was. In the city and in the state, they took pension holidays and they didn't put into the pension fund what the annual requirement was because it seemed to be good times and the pension seemed to be well funded. But when you don't make those contributions on a regular basis, it's just like your personal saving. If you save a little bit every month, you're in much better shape than you if you wait until some your roof leaks or you got some other problem, then you gotta take it out of your present revenues. Good evening, President Pre President Pret Winkle. My name Hi. is James Miles, a professor here. And my question comes from my time working with Dr. Terry Mason under Dr. Raju's tenure yes. down at Oak Forest. So then we were trying to address health disparities in the south suburbs and looking at uses for oak forest. Yes. And there's a lot of uh, concern about that. So question one, um, what, what has been decided about oak forest and expansion of services to address that? And number two, has there been any talk about um, combining Cook County's uh, public health with Chicago's public health department? Okay, uh, Cook County at one time had three hospitals, our west side flagship hospital, which was Cook County Hospital. The new hospital, of course, is Stroger Hospital. Provident Hospital on the mid-south side, and then Oak Forest on the far south side. And Oak Forest uh, became basically a long-term care facility. Um, and when Dr. Raju, who was, uh, came from the New York public health system, came here to run our system for a couple years before he went back to New York, when he looked at Oak Forest, he said, it doesn't make sense for us to run a long-term care facility there. What we really need is a regional outpatient center, ROC. And uh, so that facility was converted from a, uh, basically a long-term care facility to a regional outpatient center that could serve a lot more people and better deal with uh, healthcare needs of the Southland. 
So that's what it is now. It's a regional outpatient center in which we've invested about $20 million in, in uh, transforming one of the buildings on the Oak Forest campus to that purpose, to, to make it a uh, primary care and specialty clinic, and um, to bring in new equipment. So that's what it is, a regional outpatient uh, center for ambulatory care for people who can walk in. Yes, this lady has been waiting some time. <laughs> Good evening, President Prevenko. Good evening. My name is Karen Motley, and I work for the charter school system, uh -huh. but I'm also a graduate student here in policy administration, master's degree. My question is very different from everyone else's. That's okay. I have followed your career in leadership for the last 20 years, and I'm very interested in knowing what you think your cornerstone accomplishment is. Okay, well, there, there are three things I've been trying to do in this job. Um, one is to make our health care system sustainable over the long term. And we've been um, blessed with the presidential initiative to transform health care in this country called the Affordable Care Act. And the Affordable Care Act has profoundly changed the environment uh, for health care delivery in this country. We once had a system uh, of, of last resort. We served those who were uninsured or underinsured, <coughs> who were undocumented, people who had no insurance or terrible insurance, insurance that required that they spend $5,000 out of pocket before their insurance kicked in. And we did that at Stroger on the near west side, at Providence on the mid south side, and at Oak Forest on the far south side. But the Affordable Care Act changed the environment. Seniors like me um, are eligible, of course, for Medicare. If you're 65 or older in this country, you're el eligible for federally supported health care. There's also a program called Medicaid. It's for people 19 to 64. And each state in the country had different eligibility requirements for Medicaid. In Illinois, it was those who uh, struggled with some disability or other, and then um, uninsured children. Rod Blagojevich, former governor of the state of Illinois, now in prison in Colorado, um, give the devil his due, said it's disgraceful. We're a northern industrial state, and we have uninsured children in our state, so we're going to change the parameters of our Medicaid program so that uninsured children can be covered and so Kid Care, All Kids, that, that's a program that initiated, was initiated by Rod Blagojevich. Um, in my home state of Minnesota, there were also in income eligibility requirements for Medicaid, but that was not ever true here in Illinois. But the change in federal law said whatever your, your state requirements are for Medicaid eligibility, we're going to overlay over that. <clears throat> Basically, we're going to make people who make minimum wage or less eligible. So if you make $17,000 a year or less, $20,000 as a couple, you're eligible for Medicaid. In other words, federally supported health care. And what that means is that people who were previously our patients or who had no connection to our health care system but met the eligibility, income eligibility requirements, now can get a Medicaid card and can get uh, Medicaid at, at, at hospitals and clinics across the county. Um, and that's been a godsend to them and a godsend to our health care system because for the first time in the history of our health care system, we have more insured patients than uninsured ones. For the first time in the history of our health care system, we have more insured patients than uninsured ones. And it's been a godsend to us. Previously, the taxpayers in Cook County were subsidizing health care to the tune of about half a billion dollars a year. That tax allocation is now down to $125 million. But the challenge we face is that previously nobody wanted our patients. We served them because we were their last resort. But now we're in an environment in which there are for-profit competitors who are delivering services to Medicaid-eligible individuals, and so we're competing with them. We have 180,000 people in our program, our county care program. That's our Medicaid expansion program. Um, and, but we're in a challenging environment. And so I'm hopeful that we'll be able to thrive and survive in that environment and um, 
and that, as I said, the federal support will make our health care system sustainable in the long term. So that's a long answer. The first part is uh, sustainability of our public health system. The second is uh, criminal justice reform. So I've talked about that at some length. Uh, we want to have fewer people in the jail. So it, the average over a 20-year period was 10,000. It's now down to 8,100. We think we can drive it down closer to 6,000 without endangering um, our larger community. And again, that's because there's so many people accused of nonviolent crimes who await the disposition of their cases in jail. So sustainability of our health care system, criminal justice reform. The third thing is um, we've been working with regional leaders. The seven counties of northeastern Illinois came together, the, the chairs or the presidents of the counties, their business leadership and their economic development professionals came together in December of 2013. The question was, can we work together to try to lift this region? And if so, what do we want to work on? And the conclusion was, yes, we wanted to work together. And we set out some things we wanted to work on. One um, nitty gritty issue is truck permitting. We're the capital of the Midwest. We have lots of intermodal truck traffic. That is, they take the containers off the trains and put them on the trucks, or vice versa. They take them off the trucks and put them on the trains. Um, so we're kind of the hub of the Midwest. There's lots of truck traffic. But there are different rules in every city, town, and village for weight, for what road you can be on. Uh, and we're trying to rationalize that system so there are fewer points of contract, contact for the truckers so they comply with the rules and they pay the fees that are due and owing to various cities, towns, and villages for use of their roads. Um, and hopefully we, we make that system more efficient and we have higher levels of compliance by truckers. That's a nitty gritty thing. but but. Trucking and the, the transport of goods is important to every single business. The second thing is uh, trying to support exporting. Businesses that export have a higher growth trajectory than businesses that just depend on the domestic market. So we're trying to work with small and medium-sized businesses to help them either expand their exporting or get into exporting if they're not there now. The third thing we're working on through that seven county and the city of Chicago collaborative is um, to support the metalworking industry. We've always been a big uh, metalworking center. Once we produce steel, we don't do that very much anymore, but we still do a lot of uh, metal fabrication and work with metal. So we're, we're trying to support that sector of the economy, which has always been strong and we think has the potential to grow more. So those are the three areas in which the Seven County and City of Chicago Collaborative is focusing, trucking, um, exporting, and metalworking firms. And hopefully, in, in that arena, economic development, what I hope to see is a continuation and expansion of the areas in which uh, the seven county region is collaborating. So those are the three things that I hope will be my legacy. Can you please join me in thanking President Preckwinkle for meeting with us this evening? And thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to participate, and we hope you will join us once again at our next uh, practitioner series in February. Have a good evening. Thank you for inviting me.